Distinguished Mr. Huai Jinpeng, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for hanging in there until the last part of our dialogue. The technology is growing very fast with a lot of innovation, gene editing, and AI has won the 2020 Nobel Prize. And also, we have seen many other technologies. All of these innovations are quite related. It's changing the world. It has also led to a lot of discussion about ethics. So for all these topics today, we are very honored to have invited the speakers, panelists from many different sectors. And they are, we are here to talk about these issues. We have from World Federation of Engineering Organization, Gongke, Sourceman scholars, Professor Xu Lan, Academician of Engineering, Director of the Medical School, Professor Qiao Ji, Academician of Science, Pu Mu Ming, the Chief Scientist of Microsoft, Eric Hogwitz, Oxford Information Philosophy and Ethics Professor Luciana Floridi. He couldn't get connected online here today. And from UNESCO, AI Ethic Committee, professor from Twent University of Netherlands, Peter Paul Verbeek. And the three of them are on site with me. Mr. Gongke, Ms. Chao Ji, and Mr. Xue Lan, Eric, Professor Verbeek, and Professor Floridi, and Mr. Pu, they are talking online. So the first question we have is that what are the ethical issues caused by the emerging technologies and where are the challenges and risks brought by these issues? So I think, first of all, I will give floor to Professor Qiao Jie. Would you like to answer that? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, with the technology, actually, we have the profound changes of the society, but we are challenged by the ethics. You know that ethics by itself is a philosophy issue, and also the whole framework of these ethics has been built. At the very beginning, the ethics started from medical sectors. For example, in the 14th century, the first idea of the ethics, at that time, we want to protect the patients not to be harmed. We want to protect the privacy of the patients. And the first code of the medicine, actually, during the Second World War in the Nuremberg Code, at that time, there are some the unethical medical trial on human body. So people started to talk about the ethics. So the patients, they need to know and accept these kind of trials. And then in the declaration of the Helsinki, it was proposed by WHO, the patients have the right to knowledge, they need to consent to these kind of the trials. So no matter it's about the life science or the medical science or any kind of the science we are talking about, I think technology is trying to push our society to move forward. But we also need to keep in mind what will be the impact to the human body, to our mind, to the dignity, to the laws of human beings, and also any of the social norms by these kind of ethics. So that's why I think for the ethics itself, actually, it is generated together with the technology. So today, many speakers have talked about that, especially Mr. Bai at the opening, he mentioned about the technical revolution, the gene editing, and by winning the Nobel Prize last year. But you can see everyone is also very concerned about the gene editing. It's not that expensive. It's very efficient. But this is what we call a molecular scissors. So what is this kind of molecular scissors cutting at? Whether it can be used only for pesticide or treatment of cancer or some generic diseases, there are so many possibilities there. At the same time, this kind of the gene editing may also cause some ethical issues. So that's why that even for the inventor himself, that a lot of time has been spent on this ethical and legal consideration related to the technology. 
especially the incidence of the gene editing on the infants. Actually, because this kind of technology, without the very serious review and approval by ethical committee, we see someone that to try to apply that to human being. So this is the disobedience of the law and ethical rules. And also, I'm a doctor. So I also work in the reproductive technology. Of course, the reproductive technology can help the couple to have their cute babies. But at the same time, for the diagnosis and the filtering of the technology, whether there will be some bias or discrimination of the genes, or people will try to select the best gene for their future generations, or even customize the babies for the future. So all of them are related to the chaos. So you may have your you may have your biological parents and the sociological parents. So all of them need to be further discussed. And also many people talk about the internet-based medicine or internet-based uh, diagnosis. So AI definitely will be used for the medical sector, but in the future, the testing diagnosis and the remote diagnosis, imaging technology, all of them will benefit from technology. However, there are also a lot of uncertainties in the medical sectors and also the risks related to that. And whether the doctors can really generate empathy for their patients if they remotely diagnose the patients. Another one is related to the life and the non-life, the social environment, as well as the other impact. So I think all of them need to be considered by ethics. So only by taking the consideration of the ethics, we can make this world better. Thank you much. Thank you much, Ms. Tiao. And now maybe we can listen to the Eric Hobbes, especially on the AI and ethics of AI. So please. So corporations, governments, and societies should care about AI ethics and more generally the responsible development and fielding of AI technologies. Technology and its uses have really been defining features of our civilization as humans, from stones to fire, uh, to steam, to electricity. We've created and refined technologies over the centuries and these technologies uh, end up shaping us. They, influ they influence who it is that we are, including our daily lives, our values, our work, uh, and the overall quality of our lives. The technology itself is neutral, but we can harness technologies in so many ways. Some are valuable to society, uh, and some are unfortunately uh, costly and destructive. So decisions about how and if we harness technology in various ways uh, touch on questions of values and ethics, especially when there are trade-offs. We're really at an inflection point in the development and application of a constellation of technologies we refer to as AI. And the upswing in AI is, is uh, really fueled by data, computation, advances in algorithms for machine learning and perception and planning and natural language. And these advances promise really incredible value to people in society. But with these successes are coming concerns and challenges, some quite new based on the potential effects that these technologies can have on people's lives. Uh, these concerns include safety and trustworthiness of AI systems. Uh, they also touch on fairness and transparency of AI systems. Um, many intentional as well as inadvertent influences of AI once it's fielded in the open world. One way I think about this is that with the constellation of technologies we call AI, we're coming to a situation where automation is for the first time uh, edging deeply into the realm of human intellect, uh, edging into the world of capabilities that in the past uh, we would expect humans to be doing and solely the provenance of humans, perception, reasoning, and understanding. 
So as AI is coming into these advisory and automated decision-making roles, uh, with interest and enthusiasm of harnessing them in new ways for new accuracies and efficiencies, um, we have to consider the rough edges. These bring up ethical issues. Um, we need to have discussions and to carefully reflect about best practices and when necessary regulations. Some of my key concerns, my key worries include um, whether these systems will, will be applied in a fair way and an unbiased way versus in a way that will amplify existing biases in our society, the same society that provides the data. Data fueled classifiers are, are being used uh, to guide high stakes uh, decisions in healthcare, uh, criminal justice, uh, and other areas. And these biases can be buried quite deep in the data sets, leading to unfair and inaccurate inferences. Other concerns include legal uh, issues regarding decisions made by autonomous systems versus people in terms of the goals and the trade-offs they consider. There are definitely challenges with the reliability and safety of AI systems, especially when they're used in high stakes areas uh, like medicine. Uh, other interesting challenges include how people work or interact with AI systems, uh, including uh, whether or not people understand what it is uh, that led AI systems to make particular conclusions. Uh, or recommendations. Uh, on the economic side, um, there's the potential to displace workers from jobs uh, and to amplify inequities in wealth throughout the world. Uh, and there are rising concerns and discussions uh, in other areas as well beyond economics. For example, a big discussion topic is the potential threats to civil liberties that new forms of surveillance could power in the future. Other questions that are coming up include the role of AI and military applications, uh, both in peacetime and war. For example, uh, with all the enthusiasm uh, that uh, AI might bring uh, into the, the world of defense, AI technologies could actually be destabilizing by introducing more complexity and uncertainty, especially when AI systems on multiple sides interact in unexpected ways. Uh, leading to poor outcomes, such as unwanted escalations. And there are also deep concerns with machines being used in military complex to make automated decisions. Uh, so given the, the, the rise and the uh, applicability of these powerful AI technologies, it's going to be important to have discussions with academia and also across corporations and civil society organizations uh, to bring people uh, together in, to understand these problems and to share in each other's expertise. Uh, it's also gonna be important for government agencies to explore and for multiple governments across the world to coordinate on principles and best practices and norms. Uh, we can do a lot more than we're doing today. And so there, there, there are great opportunities ahead uh, for getting together on these technologies as they edge into the realm of human intellect. Uh, thank you. Rick Harvis, now I'd like to give the floor to uh, Xue Lan. Uh, Mr. Chow and uh, Eric already raised a lot of valuable cases about the ethical challenges of the emerging technologies. There are several kinds of them. The first one is uncontrollable risks. For example, gene editing helps to fix medical problems. Yet, there may be unintended consequences on human body and human health in the long run. If the new editing is integrated into our gene library, the future consequences will be beyond our control. And Eric also talked about military application of new technologies. This is the first kind of risks for us. The second one is violation of uh, personal rights and uh, privacy. So it's very imperative for us to protect uh, data. It makes value to uh, make use of the data, but we should avoid infringing on people's individual rights and privacy. 
And another issue is about the definition of liability, especially relating to driverless car and so on. And there are also spillover into the social dimension. All these issues should be figured out to ensure uh, ethical health of new technology. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Xue. Uh, from your input, I understand that it's very important to, to explore the ethical dimension of new technologies. And it's also very important uh, for the development of technology itself, uh, given difference in culture and uh, tradition. Uh, we may have different uh, pathway for technical ethics. Uh, take these pictures, for example, in different cultures, robots may have different uh, forms consistent uh, with our cultural tradition. In, the, in East Asia, the robots may take a very cute forms. In, yet in the West, uh, the robots appear more uh, masculine. So this brings me to the second question. What are the differences in the understandings of ethics of science and technology among countries with different cultures, traditions, and development stages? I want to address this question to two panelists, uh, Mr. Gong and uh, Mr. Pu. Mr. Uh, Pu, what's your comment on that? It's for, for me to say a few, a few words. Well, I think the uh, the cultural backgrounds. Uh, I think the with, am I cultural background. Talking? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. So uh, uh, I can cite a few examples that the cultural and religious and society background uh, might affect how we view the study the society background. Uh, for example. Uh, for example, Let's say the uh, idea about um, uh, privacy. Uh, I think uh, in Eastern society or in Chinese privacy. society in particular, in a distant society, uh, uh, privacy issue is quite different. In in traditional Chinese family and community, uh, there's um, uh, much less concern about privacy. For example, you can ask people the age, their salaries. That's not an offense to most people. It's a it shows the concern and the uh, affection for some people. Uh, so the privacy issue uh, are viewed differently in, in different cultural backgrounds. That's an example. Uh, as far as the, uh, for example, an another uh, issue uh, about religious background. So how we view the uh, induced abortion, for example. Uh, even, uh, even in the United States, uh, different states with different uh, uh, different religious people with different religious background have a very different view whether uh, induced abortion is the right thing to do, and, and and there are very different state regulations about this even within one country in the United uh, States. So uh, I, we can see that uh, these are the uh, examples of cultural and religious background that affects the uh, decision. Uh, of uh, how we uh, make ethical rules. Uh, for example, another thing with regard to the uh, uh, medical applications of many technologies. In particular, the uh, uh, manipulation of uh, human embryos. Now there's a uh, different view as uh, whether at what time you consider an embryo a real human being. Is in one cell stage or right after fertilization, or in a uh, uh, early embryo in, in two weeks after 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 fertilization, or later. Now this uh, this is a very rather arbitrary. For example, some people, uh, the religious people, consider uh, the, the the moment the sperm touch the egg, it, the human being is formed while others consider maybe when the neural tube, the nervous system is formed, uh, the embryo is, uh, really think can be considered as humans. And uh, so the scientists working on in the frontier of uh, biomedical sciences, 
um, have to decide uh, what we make uh, the uh, ethical regulations in, in terms of our uh, work with human embryo. Now, most of the work is, is helpful to medical advances. For, for example, uh, correcting genetic defects and mutations without affecting the uh, germline. The, uh, in other words, you can manipulate the embryo in a way that will not uh, uh, affect the next generation. So the, uh, the germline will not be affected. That's, that, uh, there are technology, for example, there are gene mutations in the mitochondria, which is a small organelle within the uh, cell that carries a small number of genes. The, uh, the genetic uh, mutation there could be cured by replacing the mitochondria, the bad mitochondria with the good mitochondria by transplanting the embryo into an egg with, with good uh, uh, mitochondria, while the nucleus of the uh, the host uh, egg is uh, is removed, and the the technology is now available to do that, and one can cure um, the uh, mitochondrial mu mutation, uh, a disease caused by mitochondrial mutation, without affecting the inheritance of the genes, which is mostly located in the nucleus. So the technology is now available to do that. Um, and in fact, uh, whether one can do this type of embryo to help the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, people for as a form of uh, assistance for, uh, for re reproduction um, is, has to be decided. So here we see the fact that when science advances, the, it always created new problems for our society to consider, in particular in, in many of the medical areas. Um, so uh, do we stop the uh, events of frontier science uh, because they have potential problems? Or we have to uh, think what are the uh, pro and con or the benefit and the, the potential hazard of the new advances? And, and in fact, uh, there are many situations in medical sciences, in brain science, in artificial intelligence, all facing the similar problem. And so, um, but many of these considerations is uh, cultural based. Now, I am a neurobiologist. I work on the brain, uh, the, uh, the structure and function of the brain. There's a very uh, rapid advance in the technology of uh, brain machine interface in which you can um, read the, uh, the activity in the brain, decode the activity in the brain by invasive or non-invasive uh, technologies. And you can also use external stimulation to change the brain activity to affect behavior of the, uh, and the outcome of the, uh, the behavior uh, of the uh, uh, human being by changing its brain activity. Now, there are drugs now being developed to help uh, many diseases. Now, the drug can be developed to help the brain function. Now, you know, in the past, we all think that medicines are used to help the human being, to, to cure human being, to cure diseases. But what about drugs that enhance human function? Uh, for example, the so-called cognitive enhancer, the, the drugs that can enhance your cognitive function, make you think faster, you, your memory gets better. Uh, are these drugs that we allow the society to develop and use uh, 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 in a commercial, uh, as a commercial product? Now, can people take uh, cognitive enhancer when they take exam? Uh, is it uh, just as unfair as taking uh, stimulants uh, for athletes during the uh, Olympic uh, competition? The same, the same type of uh, rule has to be, a, a similar rule has to be established. How we uh, develop drugs that are not just uh, repair or cure human uh, 
uh, uh, uh, diseases, but uh, drugs that enhance human functions. Uh, so I think uh, these are the issues which uh, uh, would all depend on uh, our cultural and, uh, and background, society background. Uh, I, I'm particular, I, I see that, uh, uh, I just heard uh, 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 Professor Verdict's talk, uh, or uh, Dr. Eric uh, Howitz, uh, Howitz talk about the artificial intelligence, the advance of artificial intelligence, uh, what it could do to the society. Now, one can think that the, the society, the level of society, developing country versus developed countries, will have very different needs for advanced AI technology. Right? Take, for example, robots, the machines that can re replace uh, manual work. Now, in a country like China and other developing countries, there are a huge number of, a large labor force that, that depends, on, their livelihood depends on working in the uh, industries, in the factories. Now they can be, we can see very soon, their job will be replaced by more advanced, more intelligent robots. Um, and we, in a society that doesn't have uh, a, uh, a, a sufficient uh, social welfare program or job retraining program, we will see massive unemployment in our labor force. This will not happen in the United States or in other advanced countries. So the societal uh, differences, we will have to make this uh, ethical issue about the development of highly intelligence uh, machine and systems uh, with the different rules. Uh, so I, I think uh, we have to deal with it. And I think this yeah, is uh, uh, right. the topic yeah. for the next uh, uh, few uh, discussions. I'll stop here. Yeah, great, great points, uh, Professor Moore. Yeah. Now we just have to ask the Chinese government. So now I will give floor to Professor Gong. Actually, Mr. Pu, he has made a very good point. Actually, last year for our World Federation of Engineering Organizations, we have made a statement about responsible use of the big data and AI. We compared from the, the practice from the Microsoft, Google, and IBM universities. We found that there are a lot of things in common. However, because they are at a different stage, for example, some countries, they emphasize on the privacy of the data. But some developing countries say, you need to open data first. If we don't have data, what shall we protect? So for the same data, in the same statement document, we talk about open, we talk about the sharing. We need to find a way to apply to different stages because, because we try not to use ethics to protect a certain group of people but the whole human being, we need to acknowledge the difference and we need to have a very good dialogue like today and to reach consensus. And then we can develop the technology. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think the two speakers, I think I feel that as a responsible scientists, we need to understand that the boundary of the science, we need to also explore that the mechanism to respond, especially with our international friends. We can reach consensus on that. At the same time, that will lead to another question. I want to ask, how do we have the international cooperation on ethics of science and technology. What are the main obstacles? First of all, I will give floor to uh, Professor Verbeek to answer the question first, and then Professor Xu. Thank you very much. I'll be very happy to answer the question. Maybe it would be good to start with the question, what are the main obstacles? And I think actually there are two main obstacles. Maybe the first one is the, the differences in value frameworks that we have, and maybe sometimes also the lack of understanding of each other's value frameworks. And the second is competition, the competition that sometimes occurs between nations, which might also make it hard to reach a consensus in ethical terms. But if we focus on the differences in value frameworks, typically I think 
well, everyone could easily agree that there is a difference in uh, individual values versus more collective values. That's a, a distinction that runs through the world and everyone thinks that both sets of values are important, but typically in Western cultures, there's more focus on the individual and in Eastern cultures, there's more focus uh, on the, well, not only Eastern, also Southern, hey, on uh, the society as a whole. And um, in AI ethics, for instance, you see that uh, frame happening all the time, hey, where the question is, should we typically protect individual freedom and also, um, uh, and, well, the possibilities uh, for entrepreneurs, uh, or should we focus on the collective, on society, on the flourishing of society and on collective values? And that also brings us then maybe to the issue of competition. Yeah, so what you see in AI is typically then also a competition between East and West, and then the EU uh, uh, well tries to have a third way, <laughs> as it were, uh, between the East and the West. Whereas what, what we need, of course, is a common way, <laughs> a place where we can all meet, where we can understand each other's value frameworks in order to develop good ethical guidance for AI technologies and for all uh, technologies, because their impact is not local, their impact is global. If we speak of biotechnologies, if we speak of environmental technologies, technologies of climate engineering, and also artificial intelligence, digital technologies, they affect the entire world. If we speak about AI, typically I would say it affects the human mind, it affects how we think, how we understand the world, how we make decisions. And therefore, global uh, places are needed to meet. And that's maybe uh, what we uh, uh, could use to strengthen the, well, the interaction between people, is to organize places where we can typically also start to understand each other's frameworks. For me, UNESCO is such a place. This World Commission for the Ethics of Science and Technology uh, has 18 members from all over the world, so really from all over the world, with totally different frameworks. And actually, we always succeed in reaching an agreement on the basic sets of values from which we should deal with specific emerging technologies. And for me, that always is a very big source of inspiration. We can do it if we talk long enough if we understand each other's framework. So I think, first of all, that is the most important uh, way to strengthen the cooperation. It sounds maybe a bit vague, but just places to meet and to understand each other and to overcome the lack of understanding that there is now. And then second, I think to overcome the issue of competition, it would also really be important to work towards global governance mechanisms that help us to deal uh, with the differences between nations and the interests of nations to also take the global perspective into account. And for that, I think we could try to develop impact assessment tools, for instance, tools to try to anticipate the impact of new technologies on human beings, on societies, where, of course, also different value frameworks can be used to evaluate the impacts. But still, we have this common understanding of what is at stake and how we could deal with that, accepting that we might also sometimes deal with things in a different way. And it also, to conclude, I think um, requires us to, to, to find an alternative way to connect ethics to the development of science and technology. That ethics is not some kind of an external assessor and that tries to evaluate science and technology from a distance and says what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. It's more about guiding science and technology, guiding the development of new technologies and trying to see how we could, well, maybe redesign a technology if we start to understand the impacts or how we could design mechanisms of governance to uh, control the societal impact or how we could help users to understand and to deal with technologies in some kind of critical way. So places to discuss, governance mechanisms and impact assessment tools would be for me the most important ways to strengthen the collaboration between nations. It's a great point, Professor Verbeck. Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, have uh, uh, Xu Yuanzhang uh, talk about this question. Okay, now we would like to invite Professor Xu. I think Professor Verbeek, Verbeek has made a very good point. I also want to start with uh, obstacles we have. I think first of all, you may see that after the Second World War, until the recent decade, the scientists or technology developers, as well as the people who apply the technology, the number of the practitioners have grown a lot. So in that way, actually that the previous speaker mentioned, so with so many people putting into this industry, and with many countries with different value proposition, 
different stage. Of course, people may not agree with each other all the time. It's so natural that we disagree with each other. But now for the traditional technology ethics, the traditional ethic framework doesn't work anymore. For example, Ms. Tiao mentioned for the medical sector in the hospitals, the traditional ethics, for example, the Western countries, they have the very famous scientists. So we sit down, we have a meeting, and we declare a statement, and everyone agrees on this ethic statement. But nowadays, you can see it's totally different. So in the past, this kind of the mechanism doesn't work anymore. I want to give you an example. Recently, we are doing research about the governance of the gene editing. So today, you can see that this year, the Nobel Prize of the chemistry went to the gene editing. It's a technology with a huge potential, but there are also risks. So for example, in the gene editing, what is the bottlenecks for the global governance? So first of all, like I mentioned, I have been talking to Professor Yu Hanzhi from Zhejiang University and Professor Chen Shaomei from Hunan University. We have done this research and we found that about the gene editing, for the articles with the keyword in 2012, there were only seven articles. In 2018, there were 2,700 articles published. And the authors, now there are 36,000 authors writing the paper and they are from 92 countries around the world. Of course, that there are 3,600 universities, research institutes. And also we, we have tried to do some survey with the officers, but of course the recovery rate was not very high, but as many scientists replied. We found that we asked them, do you know about the ethics and governance related to the gene editing? And like I mentioned, the statement declaration, 40% scientists said they have never heard of that. So for the scientists who have really read about this statement of ethics of the gene editing, less than 20%. So that is the problem I have been talking about. Actually that we didn't realize the importance of that. And for AI, it's the same. We all have these ethical bottlenecks. So I think first of all, the most important thing is that we need to do more research be before we jump into any conclusion. So for example, we need to consider the difference of cultures of the countries, but we need to dive into these issues and to have a more frank and transparent dialogue with each other. So maybe in the future offline, so not only we have this online and offline communication, in the future that we may have some panel discussion and also we can have some crossfire of the opinions and ideas from the scientists. And secondly, I think for the scientist group, or industry association. For example, today, this, ev this event is organized by the CAST, and this kind of association shall play a leading role. So as long as we can reach consensus among the scientists, it will be much easier. Thirdly, we need to be, have a more inclusive framework from different stakeholders. For example, of course, companies may hold different views. They have their business purpose. And NGOs and scientists, each party will hold a different view. At the same time, we also need to invite more developing countries coming into this section. And as long as they can engage into this global governance framework, that we can reach consensus and we can find our common ground. And then we can really benefit the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Xue. I think the two speakers, through their discussion, you can see that the technology ethics governance is a responsibility for all of us. No matter how different we are, we definitely need to work together. And we shall not avoid to answer the question. 
So then that will lead to the next question I have for the panelists. So actually, I shall say that it's related to the question three. So if we want to build a global governance framework for ethics of technology, what shall we do? So first of all, I want to give floor for Professor Gong. Actually, last year in the UNESCO's conference of AI, so they have a proposal of the artificial intelligence with human values for sustainable development. That's what we want. So actually, that is so. The AI we need to do is they need to have the human value proposition. And also for the UNESCO and the UN, I know that they try to encourage the consensus through dialogue of that. So the governance, a prerequisite for the governance is a consensus. So definitely we cannot decouple with each other. We need to engage and communicate. Secondly, I think that the, this kind of dialogue or communication can identify the challenges and risks. We need to identify the most pressing issues and challenges, such as uh, genetical uh, editing. In China, we already have a precedent of abuse of the technology in gene editing. And thirdly, we need to figure out how to deal with these challenges from technical point of view. We shouldn't just focus on the philosophical or ethical dimensions of these issues. We need to take technical measures to ensure unbiased AI system. We need a set of standards to verify that uh, these AI systems are unbiased. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chao, how do you think of that? Uh, Madam Chao. So the previous speaker says that uh, he's leading a team in conjunction with professor from Zhejiang University on this topic. When we look at the topics uh, today, when we look at uh, the audience, I wonder how many of you are specialized uh, in science ethics. So to build an international governance system, we need a big pool of researchers on science ethics. For now, we do suffer from a short supply of such expertise. Uh, for many countries, we need to first of all build up the team of experts on science ethics. I'm specialized in pro reproductive medicine. In every hospital, the moral committee is responsible for reviewing all issues related to our medical research. It's, it's really difficult to, to find the proper expertise to staff the moral committee. And then many of them actually quit because they complain about the uh, heavy burden working at this moral committee. I totally understand uh, their complaint, but uh, science ethics is really a very complex topic. We need a adequate input. We need adequate reserve of experts and uh, expertise. Uh, this is also a priority by President uh, Xi. Uh, now we are drafting a plan to develop a panel on science ethics. And we do have some workflow to follow, such as ex, uh, ex ante application, in process monitoring, and ex post review. Meanwhile, we also need to train the scientists and engineers on science ethics. Also, take the uh, gene editing, for example. As you mentioned, uh, there is already a precedent, uh, precedent of abuse. The researcher, the leading author, didn't plan uh, to 
violate uh, the ethical standards, yet he had little insight about the ethical requirements, and nor did he seek consent from the uh, subject. That's why he was criminally penalized. This is really a lesson for everyone to take to heart. And we should also increase the presence of science ethics in other adjacent sectors. For uh, basic research, we need to be more flexible to encourage innovation. Yet when it comes to human body experiments, we have to ensure the highest standard of science ethics. Thank you, Madam Hao. I want to make an additional comment. Uh, uh, Mr. Chiao talked about, uh, you, you mentioned that we need uh, improve training on science ethics. On the one hand, we need to promote public awareness of science and technologies. Yet for the scientists and engineers, per se, we also need some training and awareness promotion. As mentioned, we have organized a survey. Some argue that we need to suspend research in gene editing. According to our survey, 30% of respondents say that we should suspend the uh, test of gene editing, and 40% are neutral. This shows uh, strong disagreement among scientists. This also shows that many scientists are still confused about this uh, ethical topic. So this is really very uh, good input. Uh, I have also talked to Dr. Howitz, uh, chief scientist of Microsoft uh, three years ago a partnership for AI was set up to ensure ethical compliance in the AI sector. So let's play a video by Eric. Seems that we have some technical hiccup. Hemi, uh, can I can I make a statement? The partnership on the real world products and services, including work on governance. Uh, taking prototypes, making them uh, hardened for, for actual corporations to go. Uh, the idea was to build an open platform for doing studies, developing and sharing best practices, uh, bring together the best ideas on the influences of AI and people in society. Now, the main impetus for the initiative uh, has been to bring together diverse stakeholders, uh, researchers in academia, uh, business leaders, policymakers, and others um, uh, to get together and come to the same page on these challenging issues. The partnership was initially founded by concerned AI scientists from some of the world's largest AI companies. Um, back in 2015 or so, uh, AI scientists, including myself, got together uh, and um, we shepherded our companies, and these include the founding companies, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, with DeepMind, and IBM, to join up with nonprofit organizations. And these included academic teams, civil society, groups like the ACLU, 
and nonprofit AI research teams like OpenAI uh, and the Allen AI Institute. Um, the partnership is now led by a board of directors that's balanced between for-profit and nonprofit. There are over a hundred member organizations involved. You can read more about the membership and the group at partnershiponai, one word, dot org. Um, it, it's great to have this together. Uh, it, um, Baidu was the first Chinese company to join the partnership. Uh, Chinese companies can get involved by reaching out through the membership link um, on that site. You can go to that site too to read more about the tenants, the basic principles, uh, starting with the first basic founding tenant of the organization. We seek to ensure that AI technologies benefit and empower as many people as possible. On the site, you can also see um, high quality reports on criminal justice, facial recognition, uh, the use of risk scores in criminal justice, as well as some interesting technical work across the community, like coming up with shared uh, standards for documentation, um, documenting the data, the model, and its accuracy and performance, the maintenance needs across the whole machine learning uh, life cycle. And so looking ahead, we'll be continuing to work on these key pillars, and it would be great to have more people involved and more organizations involved in the partnership. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so from your introduction, I believe we need to speed up the future-proof and authoritative research on ethics, and then we also need to establish similar authoritative organizations and platforms. Um, Madam Chiao also talked about how to advocate a system of science and technology to benefit all. With scientific advances, we want to find the truth about this world, and also we want to benefit the people. We want to have more participation and engagement from the public to do a better job. That brings me to the last question of this panel. What are the responsibilities of the scientific community, and how should we promote the public understanding and the public participation in science and technology governance and ethics? First of all, I want to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ve Big. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think oh, that's a crucial question uh, to uh, address here, actually, because, because um, I think basically what we need to do is to expand the current work that is being done on responsible research and innovation. That is a framework to bring ethics to technology development and to scientific practice. But at the same time, given the profound impact of new technologies on society, we will really need to, to, to expand the current frameworks. I think one of the most inspiring frameworks for that is the involvement of citizens in uh, scientific work. Uh, so citizen science is uh, well a, a dimension of scientific practice that is emerging rapidly, and that brings a new dimension to the connection between science and society, where scientists are not only explaining uh, the scientific work that they are doing to citizens, but also try to engage citizens in the way in which they do that work, not only to execute the work uh, of the professor, as it were, but also to get involved in, well, asking the right questions. Yeah? For instance, at the university where I work, patients are involved in medical research from the unique uh, source of knowledge that they have because they they have a disease so they have a specific source of knowledge that the medical doctor could could never have and engaging them also in the execution and in the well the agenda setting of research is very uh, important now i think we can take that to ethics as well i think responsible research and innovation should maybe do uh, three things it should uh, try to bring ethics inside science and technology. So it needs to be ethics from within, not from outside, not an external assessor, like a, a medical ethical evaluation committee that says yes or no to a, a development, but it connects more scientific practice, technological innovation to the ethics itself. So ethics from within. Then another line is it should be, I think, positive ethics and not only negative ethics. It should not only try to demarcate what we do not want and set the boundaries of what we do not want, but it should try to articulate what we do want. So positive ethics doesn't mean that uh, we should find any innovation good, but it means that we try to articulate the values on a global scale from which we would like to let our innovations be guided. 
And maybe the third and most important thing, and also the connections to, uh, well, science and society, is uh, also the ethics, I think, should not be top-down, but bottom-up. So ethics, of course, is a matter of ethical experts also. But it's also a matter of people who are experiencing the impact of science and technology, people who have to work with science and technology. So engaging citizens and professionals in ethical reflection is crucial for a good connection between ethics and innovation. And I have some experience in this myself. I've been responsible in the Netherlands for the ethical evaluation of the COVID contact tracing app that the government has developed, where we did an ethical evaluation of uh, the design of the app with a group of experts, which was highly interesting, uh, which focused a lot on uh, individual freedom uh, and on privacy and avoiding too much surveillance, etc. At the same time, we also did a, a citizen panel which was really interesting because it showed that people in practices, so people working at a soccer stadium or people checking your tickets in the train or uh, medical doctors, uh, they, they had different concerns. They really tried to uh, use the app also as a, as a way to show solidarity to each other. And that gave different ideas about how we could maybe redesign the app or implement it in society. It uh, taught me actually that uh, it's important to not only try to formulate abstract principles that can top down be uh, well um, spread over society as it were but it's also important to well ask bottom up what are the concerns and the good connection i think between the expertise of the experts of the scientists of the professional ethicists and the people experiencing the impact of science and technology that connection should be at stake in this new form of uh, rri that we should develop i think excellent uh, professor Moore. professor paul Yes, uh, I would uh, like to echo uh, uh, Professor Wernick's uh, uh, talk about the bottom-up approach for ethics uh, development. And in fact, uh, we, uh, we just saw a case in AI uh, where uh, Dr. Horowitz talked about the AI non-profit organization of AI or, uh, industries to work together uh, to set standards. Now, I recall in 1970, in fact, the genetic edi editing, gene editing doesn't start not, uh, a few years ago. It actually starts in the 70s when the, uh, the first uh, uh, DNA season was, dis uh, was discovered. Yeah, at that time, it's called uh, uh, recombinant DNA or genetic engineering. Well, when that technique appeared in the, in the mid 70s, scientists are aware of the danger the society was alert that you might create uh, organisms which are uh, harm, uh, would be harmful to society. In fact, uh, it's, it's a bottom-up uh, uh, activity started from a group of Stanford scientists. Uh, there was a famous conference uh, called Oscillama Conference, where uh, a few hundred scientists working in the frontier of uh, recombinant DNA together with lawyers, humanists, uh, I think uh, social scientists in all cinema to discuss what we should do in terms of regulating the genetic engineering or genetic uh, uh, editing in the laboratory. What type of organism to use which are safe and they finally come up with a guideline. And that guideline would later become the guideline for NIH for recombinant DNA research. And in fact, it was a guideline now uh, used uh, worldwide. And everybody agree how you, how you, how, uh, what are the uh, uh, safe things to do? In fact, I think uh, people working on genetic editing knows what are the dangers, what are the things that, uh, that, that uh, collectively we all have uh, very similar uh, views. For example, you cannot edit in gene, uh, the embryos uh, that would cause the uh, germline transmission of your edited uh, mutations. Now, the, this uh, uh, guideline is there. In fact, I, I, there's a global collective awareness uh, about what to do. Uh, the, when the, uh, you remember when the, uh, the cloning of the, uh, the uh, first appear, the uh, clone, uh, the somatic cell cloning, the uh, Dolly, uh, Dolly, uh, 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 the ship, Dolly the ship. Was cre uh, created in the in the in the seventies, uh, 
in 20 years ago, about 20, 20, uh, I think uh, 25 years ago, people start worrying that now one can clone humans. And in fact, scientists uh, uh, all knows that this human cloning is, uh, is uh, prohibitory. Uh, and in fact, nobody is, uh, uh, any reasonable scientist uh, would think about this uh, uh, human cloning. In fact, the United Nations General Assembly actually passed a non-binding resolution in 2005, I think, which banned uh, and 25, uh, 26 countries signed for it that banned all forms of human cloning, including the cloning for medical purposes, for medical uh, treatments, uh, for getting the, uh, the human organs by cloning. And they, uh, people all consider this incompatible with human dignity and, uh, and uh, you say it's a code of conduct that's collective and global. And I think this is uh, possible when you could be uh, most likely initiated from bottom up by frontier people working on the frontier, knowing the danger, by ethicists who has concern about what are potential dangers of the new technology, and then come up with uh, uh, approaches, conferences, organizations, and then eventually establish a, a universal code. And, and when we talk about universal code, it actually exists for animal research. We have a universal, universal code called 3R principle, uh, called uh, a, a, a replacement, uh, uh, a reduce, reduction, and refinement. And the, the 3R principle is the way you handle animals. Right? You reduce uh, the uh, use of the animal that are further away from the human being. If you can do a lower species, you, you, uh, you replace lower species with higher species. You reduce the number of animal use to the minimum. You refine the condition for animal treatment to the, to the most optimum. This is universal, right? So there are universal code of conduct that can be established that everybody will agree. And then within that, I think that they, they could be a local or more regional code uh, that that needs to every society or countries might, may consider, uh, and and that that the that people around the, around the world should understand that this uh, regional code is uh, is um, uh, likely and permissible. For example, the regional code of uh, uh, forbiddance uh, for induced abortion, for example, that's a regional code. Right. So, so I think uh, uh, we, the, the, uh, there are obstacles opt uh, ahead for setting ethical code in the future, but the pathway are there. Uh, I think we can achieve it with, uh, with, uh, the his uh, with the history has told us this can be achieved. And I also re remember a very important case, in, in, especially at this time uh, for this uh, global uh, crisis and the, uh, the competition uh, between East and West. Uh, now, uh, potential Cold War starting. Uh, the, 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 we remember in the early 50s when the, when the atomic bomb become a threat, there's the famous Parkwash conferences. They are initiated by scientists, firstly actually by Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein. But the conferences was proposed by them, but they didn't attend it. But the, this conference still pers uh, persisted until now. It's a conference on science and world affairs, mostly de de dealing with the, uh, the perils of uh, atomic, uh, and, uh, atomic uh, 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 nuclear weapons, basically. And it actually created very useful consequences. The nuclear disarmament uh, treaties uh, in a large part was, was uh, promoted by uh, scientists uh, and uh, people uh, who are working together to find a consensus. And that pushed the government eventually, uh, uh, the, uh, the disarmament uh, treaty was a form. So that's a code of conduct, right? So I think uh, conferences that covers a wide uh, participant uh, on all sides 
of the uh, society or region of the world. Developed country uh, and developing countries uh, should all participate in the discussion of the future world of con uh, uh, the code of conduct uh, in ethics. And Same. I think this is the issues we have to work with. And then the other issue we, we just heard about uh, education in, uh, in ethics to the uh, students and for, to the uh, society, that's a separate issue. The regulation, once uh, the uh, ethics is uh, established, the regulation is uh, totally another, another issue. Uh, that, uh, the, the, the issue of He Jian Kui of uh, uh, gene editing of embryo, human embryo, uh, those are rogue scientists and those are cases for regulation, uh, government regulation. It's not uh, it's a side issue. In fact, I, I, I don't think any, uh, it's a real rare case uh, that uh, it's not a, a case of uh, education. It's simply an outlaw scientist uh, who did something he knows he shouldn't do. Uh, so uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, I think I should stop here. Yeah, thank you, Fu Yuan. This advice is very good, because we are the last question. So thank you very much. I think that's a very good suggestion. I think for the CAST or for other associations around the world that International Science Council is doing one thing that is we know CAST has also engaged into that. We are trying to work out about a statement related to the responsibility and the liberty of the science, because we always say that the science is free. Of course, science is free and open, but we also need to shoulder our responsibility of the science. On the one hand, we encourage the innovation, but we also need to bear in mind about the responsibility. We are also revising our code of conduct. So actually, it's not only about the technology innovation, but on the ethics, we shall also play the leading role. Mr. Xu, Ms. Xiao, do you want to add anything? I think just like we said, how we can let public to be more engaged, for example, into the ethical issues, we also need to rebuild the confidence and the trust from the public to the science. And this kind of the trust in the past few years has been sabotaged. So that's why I think this is a common responsibility. Yes, I think we are here to talk about the scientific governance and ethics. I think the important thing is that for the high tech company, they also need to realize the importance of that. So Eric Horvitz, he has also recorded some videos. So he will talk about some of the work and research he has, in, he has done in AI. So we will try to play the video, the third video of Eric. It's been a journey uh, working to set up uh, and to uh, lead the Ether Committee at Microsoft. Ether stands for AI Ethics and Effects in Engineering and Research. I work with Brad Smith and Harry Shum to set up the Ether Committee and its working groups four years ago. The purpose of Ether is to work across all of Microsoft and with its partners on rising questions, challenges, and opportunities ahead with the development and fielding of AI and related technologies. Uh, the group considers uh, potential rough edges, concerns, and policy coming to the fore with new kinds of tools, applications, and thinks through best practices and policies for the company. It's interesting because it's a, it's a company-wide uh, process and committee that works with corporate divisions, as well as uh, with the leadership of the company on company-wide policies. There's a main committee, and then a set of working groups that are cauldrons of creativity as to uh, thinking through specific topics. There are six working groups now, and they cover what we call Microsoft's AI principles, and these include privacy and security. 
fairness and inclusiveness, transparency, reliability and safety, and others such as human AI collaboration and a sensitive uses panel. The sensitive uses panel actually is a, is a cross company panel that deliberates on specific technologies coming to the fore and questions on ethics, uh, especially for high stakes areas. And that committee has made recommendations to Microsoft's leadership team on policies moving forward for how technologies are used and shared, whether they should be gated or not, um, protected from general use, for example, given the prospect that they can be used in costly ways. I've learned several lessons uh, uh, over the years um, with, with building Ether and leading the effort. The first is that it takes many teams coming together to make uh, an effective, responsible AI program at an organization like Microsoft, uh, given the breadth of the company uh, and the, the span of its products and services and its businesses. Second, I've learned it's important really to have the top leadership, right up to the CEO, in our case, Satya Nadella, uh, being enthusiastic and supportive, to have our backs. Uh, third, I've learned that it can be quite difficult to go from the, um, the ongoing uh, flurry of ideas about ethics and AI into concrete uh, fielded policies and technologies, uh, making you know, it a reality. And this includes work on taking nascent ideas and translating them into real world products and services including work on governance, uh, taking prototypes, making them uh, hardened for, for actual corporate use. Um, you can learn more about some of the efforts that we've done and some of the successes on our websites, um, including sites at GitHub uh, and Microsoft.com. On GitHub, I recommend people take a look at InterpretML, a site with code and examples on building more transparent AI. Also, fair learn uh, tool uh, and examples for how to understand biases and fairness in our data sets in AI applications. And you can learn more about Ether more broadly uh, by searching on our approach to responsible AI at Microsoft to read about the principles and some of the ways we've reduced nascent ideas uh, into practices. And just to end on a few other lessons that I've learned, um, it's clear to me that leadership must be ongoing you can't just start something uh, and have it pop or just spontaneously combust across a company. Leadership involvement must be consistent and continual. It's also never too late to start. I wish we found it either earlier. Uh, and finally, I must, must say that I'm really proud to see how far we've gotten uh, in so short a time, how Ether has grown. We've created other organizations to support the, the, the effort as well. I want to extend my thanks to Harry and to the organizing committee for bringing this great workshop together. Uh, it looks like there are great topics being discussed. There's so much to do uh, and it's best to work together, whether we're separated by oceans, by organizations, or by governments. Thanks very much. Thank you. We have implemented a survey for the public. It's about the most concerned issues in the ethics of science and technology. As you can see on the big screen, many issues discussed today are also top concerns for the public in the field of science and technology. So with this survey, I want to tell you that uh, public participation is instrumental to science governance and uh, science ethics. Kant once said that uh, human are the ends, not the means. I think it's also applicable to science and technology. In this era of fast iteration and innovation, we are more pressed than ever to strengthen this scientific community. We want to engage more dialogue 
on science ethics and expand our consensus. I hope in the future we can have more dialogues like today's. I'm very thankful to CAST for offering us this platform for exchange. And I also want to thank all the panelists for your contribution. In particular, I want to thank you all for, your, for joining us and staying with us till now. Thank you very much.